he, my best friend and I, were just bouncing a fuzzy gray ball that had lost most of its bounce back and forth. The dog, the big sheep dog who lived next door, was in its own yard, just on the periphery. It was always there, like the broken sink in the vacant lot we went to sometimes to look down at our houses. And then it jumped at him, knocked him down, that engine in its throat humming loud enough to be heard over him screaming. I ran. I couldn't tell where he was under the dog. I'd been told not to run. That was wrong. But what was I supposed to do? His mother was already coming out right at me, and I got behind her. The dog was gone. And then my friend was gone. The big blue car came out from behind the house, and he went in, still screaming, a towel pressed to his face, with the stain starting to come through. I heard enough from what his mother told mine to see what happened, why the dog was gone. Two men from the pound came and stood on the owner's porch, and stared at themselves in the man's wraparound sunglasses. I'd seen him through the slits in the fence that kept his backyard from the neighborhood, so I could see him in his white t-shirt, v-neck, telling them they were welcome to take the dog if they were willing to come in and get it, and they said they'd be back. That was the summer of the drought. Toward school's end, I watched the corn come up emerald, then turn gold in a field just past the road my street disappeared into. A year later, the field itself was replaced by turnkey condominiums, every other one painted yellow. That was the summer my quarter Cherokee grandmother pulled down from the overhead crawl space an old book of tribal stories, and I learned that in the beginning, the wolf and the man used to sit together by the fire until the dog came down from the hills and drove the wolf away. Now the wolf lives alone in the hills. I had to pee. My dog and I were out together in the summer night, following each other and finding our way in the dark by smell and sound. If I went back inside, I'd lose my night vision. So I dropped my shorts by a tree and let go, the stream reflecting the pieces of street lamp that came through the trees. I couldn't see the mark I left, but I knew it was there. My territory. I was zipping back up when I heard my dog barking in the street. I ran, and there she was with the man who lived two doors up, pinned against his car. She went after him like a stranger. Damn it! You better get this dog away from me, or I swear I'll do something. I'll, I'll kill it, I swear! He swore and leaned at me while I grabbed my dog and put my face in her ruff and pulled her back to me. It was time to go in. The next day I was in my front yard when he came home. He came over and didn't look at me, just said, Son, I want to apologize about last night. I'm sorry. I just wasn't myself. You understand. He raised his fist and something gold flew from it, sparkling, and I caught a butterscotch medallion. I understood. I knew more than he realized. Had known since the first week of summer when I was coming up the back steps to water the bean plants I'd brought home from school in a paper cup where they'd sprout and die. I heard my father talking, telling someone who dropped by something so serious I knew I shouldn't be listening. He'd been drinking all day. Maybe around sunset he decided he wanted fried chicken for supper and sent his wife out to get it. We hadn't been here that long and didn't know any of this was going on. She was gone too long to suit him or something. I really don't know. But while she was gone, he decided he was going to kill her when she got back. She got away somehow and came down to our house. We let her in and he stood there on the porch and yelled and swore. The kids were gone that night, away at camp. I called the cops and it took eight of them to get him into one of their cars. She stayed with us that night and told us, It's over. He won't do this to me ever again. We didn't know that it had happened before. We saw them next week at the pool, holding hands. She smiled, but he wouldn't look at us. I thought, never again. They're lucky it wasn't worse than it ended up being with all those guns he has in there. This was news to me. I thought all addicts were the same, webby with years of old clothes and moth dust and naked bulbs over rivers of cotton candy insulation. Now I saw the inside of the three-cornered roof with blue steel bars marching along the walls like corrugated wallpaper, or bare columns propping the whole structure. On the dead-end street, late in summer, the world was hot and thick all night. Not even the moon frozen outside my window could cool it. In drought, wind in the leaves sounds like footsteps. You wake up believing someone else is in the house, and the phone is in the other room, or dead. There at the yard's edge, the jingle of metal on metal means tags for rabies, or just house keys, someone else coming home. Across the street is the opal of a doorbell, or a cigarette of someone blindfolded. 
The movement I see in the window is my hands washing the dishes. The reflection imposed on the brown stubble of the yard. If I went out, water on my hands would freeze and break. I keep all the doors locked from inside.